So the presentation is uh, is largely based on a review uh, I wrote and has been recently published in the Astronomy and Astrophysics Review on, on this subject, the evolution of CNO elements in galaxies. Uh, but I like to, to start uh, with uh, some uh, introductory remarks. Uh, some obvious things, okay, uh, we know that carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen are the most abundant elements in the universe after hydrogen and helium, so it is very interesting to study these elements, and you can measure their abundances basically everywhere, from uh, smallest dust grains uh, to the uh, um, atmosphere of stars, uh, in the interstellar medium of galaxies, in the intracluster medium, so it is very important to understand how these elements uh, are produced in stars and how they enrich the uh, interstellar medium. Uh, there are seven stable isotopes, and uh, we, we know pretty well how they are produced in stars. And I, I put a question mark here uh, about how well we really know how the stars produce the CNO elements. Okay, we know that uh, 12C is produced in helium burning, uh, some uh, 16O is also produced in, in helium burning uh, at the expenses of uh, 12C. Uh, we know that there is a cold CNO cycle in stars, uh, activating in main sequence and the giant branch stars uh, and producing 13C, uh, 14N, 17O. If the temperature is high, really high, uh, the hot CNO cycle can activate. And uh, so you have also the formation of rare isotopes, uh, 15N and 17O again. This is basically explaining the production of these rare isotopes from NOVA systems. And then also 18O, uh, this uh, rare oxygen isotope is easily destroyed in stars, but in some massive stars, it, a fraction of it can survive further uh, uh, nuclear burning, and so in the end, uh, its abundance can increase in galaxies. But uh, there are uncertainties uh, in all this stuff, uh, and uh, as you well know, for instance, the 12C alpha gamma uh, 16 O reaction rate is one of the uh, most important unsettled rate in nuclear astrophysics. So there are large uncertainties uh, basically because uh, we don't have direct measurement of its rate. We need to uh, extrapolate the um, the measurement that can be done in a laboratory. And also I was quite surprised by reading this recent paper by Kibedi et al. a couple of years ago. Uh, they measured the radiative width of the oil state of uh, 12C and uh, their new measurement determined an increase of more than 30% in the uh, rate of the triple alpha, alpha capture reaction. And I mean, 30% is a lot, and we still do not know how the nucleosynthesis in stars, uh, the, the stellar reels, uh, will change because of this um, modification in the rate of this important uh, nuclear reaction. And then, of course, this is just talking about the nuclear reaction network in stars, but then you have all the uncertainties related to the stellar evolution, because in the end, what we want uh, are the stellar reals, because if we want to compute how the abundances of these elements evolved in stars, we need to know how much um, of, of these, uh, these elements is produced, which amount of these elements is produced by the stars and ejected in the interstellar medium. So uh, people computing stellar evolution and nucleosynthesis uh, give us a grid of uh, stellar yields. The quantity, the amount of newly produced elements in form of different uh, um, of different isotopes, and uh, we have several groups uh, computing these yields, and uh, these are given by a contribution from uh, the stellar wind, and uh, for the more massive stars, uh, an explosive contribution. And so you see uh, that there are large uncertainties in the mass loss rate of stars. And so the yields are uncertain, and also in the explosion mechanism of a core collapse supernovae. And uh, again, uh, we now are starting to understand how stars explode, but till a few years ago, uh, the, what people uh, uh, did was just to put some piston or uh, some other, um, uh, let's say, a dock mechanism to make the star explode, and then they computed the explosive nucleosynthesis, and all of these translate in large uncertainties in the, in the stellar yields. 
and then, of course, uh, you need to, to sum up also the contribution from the fraction of matter that has been unprocessed in the stars and ejected without uh, nuclear processing. Um, so uh, in order to compute the chemical evolution and to understand how uh, CNO elements, but also all the other elements evolving galaxies, uh, you need to uh, take uh, a set of yields that should cover as homogeneously as possible a large ranges of initial masses of the stars and chemical composition. And here uh, I put, for example, a picture uh, in, in which I collect yields from works by Paolo Ventura and collaborators in Rome for lowing intermediate mass stars, stars in mass ranging between one and seven solar masses. They uh, really made a huge effort to compute uh, the stellar yields for varying stellar metallicities from ultra metal poor stars that you see in the top corner of the, of the plot, three times 10 to the minus seven in uh, metallicity to super solar metallicities about twice uh, the, uh, the solar metallicity in the um, lower uh, right corner of this plot. And you see that the yields are very, really, that they have really huge variations. For instance, if you have a look at the dotted red lines, that is, uh, the yield of uh, nitrogen as a function of mass and metallicity, uh, you see that in the ultra metal poor stars, uh, you have just uh, a minimal production of nitrogen 14 in the range in between two and three solar masses, then this production increases. And then uh, for stars with solar metallicity or even above solar, the production of nitrogen 14 is really, really huge in the intermediate mass stars range because there you have activation of uh, hot bottom burning and you have production basically of uh, secondary uh, nitrogen 14 from these stars. So it is very important that you have full uh, stellar evolution and nucleosynthesis computations uh, providing you the yields because Imagine that you don't have this uh, very fine grid of yields and you just pick up a couple of, of, um, of yield sets uh, uh, and you see that you need to extrapolate if you want to compute the full, the full chemical evolution of galaxies and the extrapolation on the interpolation may be really dangerous because you can uh, give completely wrong, um, you can make completely wrong assumptions about the real quantities of these elements that are produced by, uh, by the stars. And also you see that yields may be negative if an element is uh, mostly destroyed rather than produced inside the stars. And you need to take this into account when computing the uh, chemical evolution of, uh, of the galaxies. So there are lots of um, prescriptions about the stellar yields in the literature. And I think it is always a good idea to test uh, many of them and not just uh, choose your uh, best uh, yield sets and uh, don't, don't test uh, also other, other prescriptions. Um, so uh, as I said, uh, we need these stellar yields to compute chemical evolution and classic chemical evolution models. I mean, models that do not include dynamical processes, but pure chemical evolution, uh, follow the evolution of the abundances of chemical elements in the ISM of the galaxies. And they need some inputs from cosmological simulations, uh, hydrodynamical studies, uh, and of course, the stellar nucleosynthesis theory. Uh, because they need to take into account several uh, processes uh, that determine uh, the evolution of the elements in the interstellar medium. Uh, so gas accretion, uh, um, star formation, uh, and uh, the stellar feedback, uh, both in terms of chemistry and energy. So the development of uh, any galactic wind uh, must be taken into account. And also processes like radial migration of stars. And uh, the important point is to take into account in details that stellar lifetimes, because the stars of different masses uh, evolve with different, uh, um, on different uh, um, lifetimes. And so different chemical elements are ejected on different uh, time scales. And uh, this, this kind of uh, 
pure chemical evolution models often assume instantaneous mixing of gas, but uh, you can also build stochastic models to take into account the inhomogeneities of the interstellar medium. And the, the strong point is that uh, they um, tend to, to, they are constructed to match uh, a, a number of observational constraints that is greater than the number of the free parameters that uh, uh, you need to, uh, to use in the models. And uh, they require re really, uh, they have low computational requirement. Uh, this is quite different uh, from uh, the large uh, chemodynamical simulations that require a lot of CPU time. And so I think uh, mm, nowadays the, the most important uh, use you can do of this kind of models uh, is testing the chemical uh, yields. Uh, and these can be used as input for complex hydrodynamical simulations. So uh, basically you are sure that the main ingredient that you are assuming the stellar yields are uh, the, the best one you can, you can choose. And in fact, the stellar yields are at the core of the chemical evolution model. Then, of course, you weight the yields with the, a, an initial mass function and uh, uh, take into account all the mechanisms uh, of uh, uh, gas accretion, star formation, galactic outflows. And this is the baryon cycling that, that you can follow in, in uh, galaxies of different types. But of course, the... Um, the models must be calibrated against the uh, data sets we have for the Milky Way uh, first, because uh, we have the better data in the Milky Way. And uh, uh, this is very important uh, that, uh, that we interact a lot with um, people that observe the uh, measure the chemical abundances in stars. Uh, for instance, I, I want to show here um, about the uh, evolution of carbon over oxygen and nitrogen over oxygen as a function of oxygen in the solar vicinity. And in the plot I'm showing here, you see the situation till a few years ago. And uh, you see that the, the data, uh, are, these are taken from different uh, authors. Uh, if you have a look at carbon over oxygen at very low metallicities, you see you see that some uh, data sets uh, as the uh, black crosses or the um, orange triangles tend to um, to predict that they uh, tend to show that the C over O um, ratio is an upturn uh, with decreasing the metallicity. Uh, so uh, at the time, uh, people computing chemical evolution models were, were really struggling to reproduce this upturn at low metallicities. Uh, but uh, uh, you see the lines, uh, uh, which are for different models, including different nucleosynthesis prescriptions, and only, only a few models predict this upturn. Other models uh, are uh, rather predicting a low C overall ratio that is basically constant uh, at low metallicities. And then for nitrogen over oxygen, uh, you have uh, problems because there are a few data and uh, the data are uh, show large spreads. So I, I, this is an open problem. We still need to understand uh, uh, what's going on and, and we need more data. And the situation, uh, as I said, has changed recently. In this plot, uh, you see uh, on the left, uh, the analysis uh, or reanalysis of uh, high resolution data for uh, dwarfs and subgiant stars made by Amarsi in uh, 2019. They used 3D non-LTE modeling. And in the right panel, you see the very same data analyzed by means of 1D LTE models. And so you see on the right, the upturn in C over O uh, ratio I mentioned before. And on the left, uh, using these uh, up-to-date stellar uh, atmosphere models, uh, the upturn is not there anymore. Uh, so one point is when we run our chemical evolution models, it is really important uh, that uh, we compare with the uh, uh, updated data uh, which are obtained using the, uh, the best uh, model atmosphere of the star. So uh, we, we won't be struggling anymore uh, when trying to reproduce this uh, upturn that apparently is not there. 
Uh, and here uh, I show some recent models I've been running. Uh, so again, uh, the, the point at low metallicity are the data from Amarsi that I just showed, 3D, non-LTE analysis. At high metallicity, I have added some, uh, some data from uh, Botteo et al. for solar twins. These are the orange, yellow, red points. Uh, you have the, uh, the sun, uh, the yellow big star, and a couple of uh, M dwarfs, the gray stars, and uh, a brown dwarf. This is the, the cross the large uh, gray cross. So um, you see that in general, uh, the, the lines, which are uh, my models uh, and are computed with different assumptions about the stellar yields, tend to uh, overproduce the C over O ratio at low uh, metallicities. And I think this is due to the fact that people computing the stellar evolutionary models uh, still had in mind the um, the old uh, trend showed by Ackerman and Fabian and, uh, and others of this, with this upturn in C over O. Uh, the only set of yields uh, that uh, predict a low C over O at low metallicity in agreement with the uh, more recent data is uh, uh, if I use uh, for the massive stars, the yields by Inomoto and this group. And this is the uh, dark green uh, curves uh, in the right panel. Uh, but in this case, I also have uh, too low C over O at the highest metallicities. So um, we, we really, we, we really uh, need to understand uh, how to obtain at the same time a good fit uh, over the whole metallicity range. With the yields by Limongi and Kieffi, and these are used in the, in the um, plot uh, on the left, uh, you have a really good fit of the data uh, from, for metallicity uh, higher than, say, uh, minus one. Uh, and you have this overproduction of uh, carbon at low metallicities. My feeling is that uh, this can be due to the fact that the yields by Limongi and Kieffi do not include hypernovae and do not include uh, the uh, pair instability supernovae. Uh, in, in this case, uh, this, this kind of, of um, explosion uh, may produce a lower C overall ratio and improve the predictions uh, between the, the models and the observations. Okay, so uh, in these other plots, uh, I concentrate uh, on the uh, high metallicity part of the diagram. And uh, the data are coming from very high resolution spectra taken with ARPS uh, by Delgado Mena and their uh, collaborators. And uh, the data are also divided uh, in uh, thin disk, thick disk, and halo components. And you have also these uh, red um, red points, uh, the high alpha metal rich stars that have been interpreted as uh, the youngest stars belonging to the thick disk. That would be uh, the 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 stars at younger ages, so just forming in the latest evolutionary stages of the thick disk. And the, the black line is a two info model. And uh, in, this, in this model, um, I, I also put some uh, squares on the, on the lines to highlight the ages of the stars that form along the evolutionary sequence. And so uh, <clears throat> you see that uh, the thick disk evolution in these, uh, in these models and at ages of 9.4 uh, giga year, and so the uh, the thick disk uh, is uh, the thick disk data are well explained, and also the red uh, points indeed are consistent with uh, lying on the on the last phases of the evolution of the uh, thick disk on the evolutionary track. And then uh, for uh, younger ages, you have the evolution of the thin disk. 
And this uh, produces this loop because you have a second info episode forming the thin disk. So uh, the attrited gas uh, in this second info episode is metal poor, so the metallicity decreases, and so uh, the curve mo moves toward the left. And then you start again forming stars and, and you move again uh, towards the right. And you have the contribution from type 1A supernovae producing a lot of iron and the curves is decreasing. And I think this kind of model can reproduce quite well uh, the data uh, you have and also the dispersion in, in the data. Still, there are problems in the low metallicity uh, domain, especially you see in the, in the bottom uh, in the bottom uh, panel, uh, that at the low metallicity, uh, the C over O ratio is uh, overproduced. This is something that I also showed in the previous plot. Uh, regarding nitrogen, uh, I, I was inspecting the recent literature, but basically there is no not so much that I can use. Uh, and uh, again, here uh, I have a set of models, the one shown with the uh, light pink and blue colors, the lightest pink and blue shades in the left panel, and the one show with the dark green on the right panel are models that do not include uh, stellar rotation. And you see that if you do, do not include stellar rotation, you cannot explain the uh, nitrogen abundances at low metallicities because uh, stellar rotation uh, allows some uh, extra mixing in these uh, low metallicity massive stars. Uh, and so you have production of primary nitrogen 14. Uh, and with this primary uh, production of nitrogen 14, you can explain the abundances uh, uh, of nitrogen you see at low metallicity. And these are the light green curve on the right and, uh, um, and the curve that better fit the data also on the left panel. So uh, these are models with, uh, with the rotation. Anyway, there is a huge scatter in the data. I'm not sure if this is related to uh, stellar evolutionary processes uh, that can mix uh, the stellar atmosphere because uh, here uh, you really would need to have dwarf stars, but many of the stars you see in this plot at low metallicity as are actually subgiants. And I'm not sure that uh, you can avoid some degree of mixing. The star that is shown as a big uh, star, big gray star, HD 140283, is a Tarnoff star. And um, this star has been analyzed in a recent paper by Monique Spitt and collaborators in 2021. And it is very interesting because they analyze some extreme high resolution spectra. They have a lot of data for this star. And uh, I think maybe it's not by chance that uh, the agreement uh, between the measurement in these stars and the models is, uh, is, is good. The star is basically falling uh, where, where the, 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 the model, most of the models uh, with primary nitrogen production are uh, are falling on the on this diagram, and we are sure that these stars didn't suffer any evolutionary process. So this is the the um, ab abundance ratio of nitrogen over oxygen in the star when it was born. No no um, nitrogen increase due to uh, internal uh, mixing of the star. Uh, so maybe future instrumentation like the CUBES uh, spectrograph will help us because uh, it will cover uh, the uh, ultraviolet range where the NH bands are falling. So maybe we will have uh, more data, especially at low metallicities to better constrain the model. So I'm really looking forward to this instrument to take data and to have improved nitrogen abundances for a significant sample, statistically significant sample of stars to better understand what's going on at low metallicities with this element. Uh, then uh, CNO, as, as, uh, as I said, uh, we have also the rare isotopes, uh, but of course in stars, uh, it is very difficult or impossible to measure uh, the, the minor isotopes. We have some measurement of 13C 
uh, mostly in giants. But as I said, if you want to study how these abundances vary in time in the galaxy, we need to look at dwarfs uh, where we don't have evolutionary processes that change the abundances. And uh, so basically we have a measurement in the sun. Now there are a few measurements uh, in a sample uh, of, uh, of solar twins by Botteu et al, which I, I didn't put in this picture that is coming from an older paper. Uh, and, and we have the molecular clouds uh, uh, across the galactic disk. So if we measure the abundances in the molecular clouds, we can trace the gradient which is important because uh, we have a picture of how these rare um, uh, isotopes evolve uh, across the disk and so uh, in different metallicity regime because the disk of the Milky Way is probing uh, metallicities from superstolar to, uh, let's say, uh, small Magellanic cloud metallicity. And uh, the problem here is that for some elements, uh, you can uh, probe the disk uh, uh, only the inner disk uh, and the outer disk, you have very few data or not, no data at all, as is the case for the 14N over 15N ratio. You see in, in the uh, right panel, uh, right middle panel, uh, the gradient of the nitrogen isotopic ratio is uh, simply um, not, not uh, uh, measured at distances from the galactic center larger than 10 kiloparsecs. So, uh, this is the situation uh, in, uh, 19, uh, in uh, 2019. This has very recently changed because thanks to, to measurements taken with the uh, IRAM uh, radio telescope, we now have uh, some data for the outer disk. In this plot, I show, uh, okay, we can, we can just look at the right plot, 14N over uh, 15N. And the gray uh, dots are uh, data for single molecular clouds uh, across the Milky Way disk. And you see that we now have data at distances as large as uh, 18, 19 uh, kpc. Uh, we have large dispersion. The fit to the data is the red curve with the uh, one sigma error shown as dashed uh, orange area. And uh, the black, uh, beige, and green curves are predictions from different chemical evolution models changing the contribution uh, to uh, 15N production from NOVA systems. So since nucleosynthesis in NOVA systems is very uncertain, comparing this kind of data with the models is really important because it offers a, a um, a way to test the NOVA nucleosynthesis uh, models. And you see, for instance, that the gray lines uh, reproduce better uh, the average trend uh, of the nitrogen isotopic ratio across the, the galactic disk. Uh, then a, a, last, uh, a last thing I want to mention, is that uh, um, it is really important to uh, benchmark our chemical evolution model against the Milky Way data because then uh, we can uh, apply this model, we can adapt this model to other galaxies also at high redshift. Uh, in this picture, I show the 13C over 18O ratio. Uh, in, in, um, in different samples of galaxies, on the right of the picture, the blue points are referring to the local universe. Uh, and on the left of the picture, uh, you have this sample, these red points uh, that are clustering at values of the ratio of about one. These are submillimeter galaxies observed at redshift between two and three. So when the universe was very young, and uh, these are galaxies that are likely the precursors of uh, massive ellipticals. And then uh, the lines that we, in different colors that you see are the predictions from chemical evolution models uh, that uh, um, assume a, a star formation history uh, made essentially with one burst lasting one giga year early in the evolution of the galaxy and then uh, you stop the star formation. So this is mimicking uh, uh, a simple star formation history as a, a massive elliptical galaxy uh, could have had. 
Uh, and uh, the, gr the green curve uh, is computed with uh, a, a stellar IMF, uh, uh, a canonical stellar IMF, the one that better reproduces the data for the Milky Way. Uh, and then uh, the other curves are computed with the increasing the fraction of massive stars. So you change the slope of the IMF and you make it flatter and flatter going from yellow to uh, black. And you see that this data, uh, certain C over 18 O ratio of about one at high redshift can be explained only if you allow for more massive stars in this high redshift starburst than in the local universe. Uh, these uh, these um, measurements have been possible only because of the advent of ALMA with its, its size sensitivity. Uh, and so in this way, we have proposed that certain C over 18 O ratio is a new powerful diagnostic of the galaxy-wide uh, stellar IMF. And of course, measurements of this, uh, this kind uh, can be made also in other, in other objects. And now we also have James WST that will collect data, uh, other data, complementary data, uh, so our hope is again to uh, to use uh, the CNO uh, elements and isotopes, especially the rare isotopes, also to um, to track uh, variations in the uh, IMF. That is another cool topic in uh, in modern astrophysics, and uh, this is just to give an idea that. Uh, the study, uh, the high precision study we do in the Milky Way have uh, uh, implications also for um, high redshift studies and to connect the uh, present situation with what happened in the in the past. And I think this is a uh, whole, so I, I, I stop here and uh, I take your questions. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the nice talk. And uh, so we have a time for questions. I also would like uh, to thank uh, Donatella. I think that uh, CNO elements uh, are not uh, enough uh, investigated uh, in our galaxy, both uh, from the observational point of view. And uh, I am very glad uh, that you are about to publish uh, the, the models uh, of evolution of those elements uh, very soon. And uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, this uh, in advance uh, with us. I thought to ask, uh, probably you could also use uh, some data from the Gaia ESO survey for the comparison. Yeah, yeah. So actually in, in one paper, uh, we recently published, um, the first author is Valeria Grisoni. We have studied the, the gradient of uh, uh, nitrogen over oxygen using the data from uh, from Gaia ESO. Yeah, uh, the problem uh, is that uh, we really we really would like to have a um, large data set for dwarf stars, uh, <laughs> while uh, we we can find large data set for giants. But they are, as I said, I'm not a hundred percent sure that we fully understand the corrections we must apply. Uh, and so, yeah, I think for, for nitrogen by sure, we need to, to, to collect more, more, uh, more data and cubes uh, I'm sure will, uh, will help a lot with this. Okay, so I have some uh, quick questions, and uh, I think you, you mentioned about the production of nitrogen fifteen by Nova Nova explosion. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. is there any uh, direct observational evidence of the production of uh, this isotope by Nova? Uh, no, as far as I know, there isn't. And uh, uh, this is just coming uh, from uh, um, hydrodynamical simulations of the outburst. 
But you know, uh, my feeling is that this is uh, like the, the problem with the uh, lithium production, uh, because uh, the models predicted lithium production, uh, uh, significant lithium production from Nova Outburst, uh, and people were not really believing that this could be the case. Till a few years ago, the first measurements of lithium abundances in abundances in Nova Ejecta were made, actually mostly beryllium, then that then decay into, into lithium. So uh, I think it is not easy to measure uh, 15N. Uh, but uh, if I take into account production from Nova systems, uh, I can explain the gradient. The other possible source of uh, uh, 15N uh, are massive stars, but uh, the, uh, the grid of yields uh, in the literature, uh, there is basically one group that produces uh, uh, important amounts of uh, 15N from massive stars, uh, and their yields uh, are very sparse. Uh, the maximum mass uh, they reach uh, is around 25 solar masses, so I really don't know what to do because, uh, you know, there are other more massive stars, so I, I cannot take their yield and just extrapolate. This would be really dangerous. But actually, massive stars are another another uh, possibility. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah. We actually we have detected lithium or beryllium seven uh, for Novi uh, several years ago. So so I nitrogen fifteen maybe the next good target for uh, study. <laughs> Uh, observational yeah, study yeah. for net novel. I think and, uh, that would be that would be really really important for us computing the models uh, because could put some constraint some constraint on on the average quantity we should put in the models. So it would be really welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another question is that about the uh, um, oxygen destruction and the uh, intermediate white star uh, you mentioned early part in your talk and uh, yeah. is it how large is the impact uh, of the ocean destruction on the uh, chemical evolution model uh, you you mean the main uh, uh, 16 0 16 0 yes yeah, yeah, is not uh, is not very large actually. Is uh, if you take into account the full chemical evolution of the galaxy, is a minor as a minor impact because uh, it is much more important the contribution from the massive stars. Okay, thank you very much. I am thinking uh, if we, for example. Uh, somehow combine uh, those uh, models of uh, CNO mixing uh, in uh, in stars. Actually, oxygen, uh, it seems that uh, it's not uh, mixed. So probably uh, abundances of oxygen uh, from uh, uh, giants also could be used. Uh, but, yes, uh, yes, sure. Um, uh, but for example, if we combine, if we could combine uh, those predictions of uh, uh, carbon and nitrogen mixing in uh, giants, uh, if we take that into account, so probably this information also could be used for for your modeling. Yeah, yeah, observational I, I think, data. Yeah. Uh, I think something that would be really welcome is uh, uh, something we discussed, and I think, Grazina, you are involved in the HRMOS spectrograph. There was a discussion in our chat about this future spectrograph, and the discussion was about the possibility that with this MOS you can target open clusters and you can obtain high resolution abundance data for both dwarfs and giants in different evolutionary phases in these open clusters. So you know very well the ages of the stars, the masses, and you have a full uh, um, picture of, the, of how this um, element evolves in the atmosphere of stars in different evolutionary phases. So I think uh, if we could build uh, um, a library of data for CNO abundances uh, in 
in several open clusters, uh, we could really understand uh, and better, better uh, constrain both the models of stellar evolution and chemical evolution then. Yes, uh, there is uh, a, a project uh, to, to build such a database uh, for CNO. We already just started to, to work on that, but uh, yes, uh, in open clusters, uh, there are not so many observations uh, for, for dwarfs, of course. Mm. So, so by now this uh, problem uh, remains, I think, from for yeah. what we have now. Yeah, I mean, it it, it is funny that uh, the the most abundant uh, elements uh, we can study in basically all environments in the universe uh, still have so many problems. <laughs> so, <I> think, <laughs> and, and and we do not discuss this very often. So I was really surprised when I was collecting uh, you know different papers uh, for my review and i was thinking look there are so many open questions about uh, these so abundant elements so yes yeah. uh, they are abundant uh, but uh, in dwarfs uh, they have quite uh, weak uh, features uh, those uh, which are not sensitive to non lte or uh, 3d and uh, those features uh, which are stronger, they still have a problem in accounting of those uh, effects of non-LTE and 3D. So, so, and this takes time to, to resolve and to make everything correctly, all the analysis. It's a conspiration, cosmic conspiration against us. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you very much uh, for your work uh, in this field, uh, and uh, uh, we here in Vilnius will uh, attempt, put all our attempts to contribute in observation uh, field, and uh, now we are finishing analysis uh, of uh, 400, uh, but of course giants, uh, not dwarfs, uh, we will see what we could do more. Yeah, thank you, you for the the huge work. Actually, I realize is I, I mean is is a lot of, of work to obtain the these uh, data set with abundances, and probably from the side of the theoretician, it is easy just to ask always for more, and we need this, and we need the other. Uh, <laughs> but I realize that there is a huge work, and it is not easy to obtain all the data we would like to have. <laughs> Yes, uh, in the case of uh, CN elements, uh, when we deal uh, with, uh, with molecular lines uh, and also when carbon and oxygen abundances are interrelated uh, with each other, so uh, very automated way, uh, not always uh, work. So a lot of uh, interactive uh, work is uh, necessary. So but we do our best of course <laughs> yes so angela thought to ask a question i saw hand no no it was clapping hand it was not uh, uh, to ask a question but since okay. I connected, then uh, we will hope to have uh, the samples of uh, open clusters, uh, both giants and uh, dwarfs observed uh, by weave first and foremost later. So by combining that, uh, I hope uh, we will be able to answer a few of the questions Antonella, uh, uh, Donatella raised today. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the nice presentation uh, and uh, see you forward uh, for future progress uh, in this field. And uh, we ask again uh, other scientists uh, to present the results uh, at this uh, seminar.